Between 1949 and 1974, Professor Nicholas Pevsner, a German émigré art historian, toured the counties of England, compiling a 46-volume guide to every building he thought was of interest, from Stonehenge to Centre Point. What's happened to that tower? That upper part is sitting at an angle on the bottom. Hevsner's guides, regularly updated, are unique. Nothing quite like them exists anywhere else in the world. Well, now for Barrow. Uh, mind that dog. In this series, six contemporary travellers take to the road with Pevsner's Buildings of England as their guide. Warwickshire is Midland indeed. Most of Warwickshire is rolling country, wild, wooded and friendly. And varied as its landscape and building materials are its monuments of architecture and art. There is an immense amount of more than local interest and more than average value. From 1967 to 1973, I taught at the University of Warwick, which in those days consisted of little more than the white rectangular buildings you see behind me, marooned in a sea of mud. Pevsner had seen only the plans, which he found compact and informal, but for those of us who lived and worked here, the built environment was so unfriendly that it became a major issue in the student unrest of 1968 to 69. And it was then that I developed an interest in the social function of architecture in building and maintaining a community. Warwick University turned its back on the landscape and on traditional building materials, being built in the same irreverent spirit that inspired Birmingham's Bullring and Spaghetti Junction. no surviving buildings genuinely connected with Shakespeare, the villages and the countryside of Warwickshire were never far from his mind. A network of Shakespearean associations crisscrosses the county. As you approach Badsley Clinton Hall, it stands before you as the perfect late medieval manor house. The entrance side of grey stone, the small creeper-clad Queen Anne brick bridge across the moat, a gateway with a porch higher than the roof and embattled, it could not be better. Pevsner contemplates buildings as freestanding structures with greater or lesser aesthetic merit. For me, the beauty of a building is inseparable from its social function. Badsley Clinton was built to protect. Its original windows are smallish and high up, windows to see out of without being seen. There's only one way in or out, a way that can be sealed at the first sign of trouble. Within, there is a warm space, defended rather than defensible. This space used to be much darker and narrower because another wing stood on the west side, which is now open to the moat. It's easy to envision this as the kernel of a community, a place where Shakespeare's ancestors, who lived in the neighbouring upland, or Arden, could take refuge in time of trouble. A good deal of the half-timbering and mullioning and what have you is fake, as if the house was in a way impersonating itself. Badsley Clinton Hall was the first great house ever to be photographed for country life. 
Nowadays, it's marketed to tourists as a hiding place for hunted papists, complete with priests' holes and concealed staircases and passages. In the 19th century, believers came here as to a shrine to the Catholic martyrs of the 16th century. Rebecca Deering, Lady of the Hall and amateur painter, filled the house with copies of the Italian masters to serve as devotional images. The Catholic chapel in the house was dedicated in 1875. A truer religious spirit seems to invest the Badsley Clinton Parish Church, dedicated to St. Michael. The church is even older than the oldest parts of the nearby manor, if we are right in thinking the nave to be Norman. The chancel windows are of 1634, when, according to an inscription inside, the chancel was rebuilt. This oak screen of 1634 is one of my favourite Warwickshire themes. It is stout but elegant, playful and earnest at the same time. Perpendicular West Tower paid for by Nicholas Broom, who died in 1517. Pevsner doesn't see fit to tell us that Nicholas Broom had to build the tower and extend the church in expiation of the horrid crime of murdering the parish priest, simply because he chocked his wife under the chin. Preservation of ancient houses grows every year more difficult and expensive. It took 30 years to raise the £300,000 endowment that finally enabled Badsley Clinton to be taken over by the National Trust. Even so, the house can't be fully open to the public without the assistance of volunteers. A few miles the other side of the M40 lies Chalcot Park, which has also been acquired for the National Trust. A descendant of the Lucy family, who built the house in the 1550s, still lives in part of it. The Lucys have held the manor of Chalcot from the early 13th century, if not the 12th. The house, as one approaches it through its broad gatehouse, strikes one as Elizabethan, it is, in fact, largely of the 19th century. Victorian mock Elizabethan, in fact. The house that Queen Elizabeth slept in for two nights in 1572 was a good deal smaller and plainer, in the style of this gatehouse. Nowadays, people might think of a house like Chalcot as a sort of very grand private residence for a very grand family. But it would be more accurate, I think, to regard it as a business. It was lived in all the year round by the professionals who administered the estate, who ran and managed it, who shipped and dealt in all the goods produced on or out of the manorial lands. This laundry and brew house are the oldest parts of Chalcot. Pevsner says they're Elizabethan, but that the bricks they're made of are older. So something got pulled down in order that this place could be built. And that's what usually happens in living buildings. They get subtracted from and added to. But now these are bygones and have got to stay in this state forever, as it were. I suppose someone's going to get the bright idea one day of brewing ale by the Chalcot method, the beer that Shakespeare drank but it won't be any realer than any other 20th century real ale. Chalcot rejoices in one of the stronger Shakespearean connections, for it was from the Lucy's Park that the poet was said by 17th century commentators to have stolen a deer. 
That story can't be substantiated. But what we know for sure is that Shakespeare mocked the pretensions of the Lucys in at least one of his plays. More intriguing to me is the fact that the Sir Thomas Lucy, who died in 1600, kept a company of players. Shakespeare would not have seen this facade which was added in the 19th century, nor could the poet of native English flowers have imagined anything as violently coloured as this modern selection of Dutch bedding plants, which are the National Trust's idea of making the environment more cheerful. What I love about genuine Elizabethan Charlcote is its functionality. From the first time I saw the house on a wintry evening nearly 30 years ago, I've imagined the people for whom it was the centre of life coming and going, carts and hay wains toiling up and down the avenue, the bringers of news and letters clattering up, and the tenants thronging to the three-weekly manorial court hearing. Now Chalcot's job is to keep still and be looked at, as unlike itself as a statue is unlike a real person. Aston Hall, a noble fabric which for beauty and state much exceedeth anything in these parts. Dugdale's contemporary judgment has even more force today about this, one of the great houses of the county, now strangely stranded in an industrial setting. Aston Hall, which was bought outright by the Birmingham Corporation in 1864, has had a strange and shabby history. It was built by a mean-spirited man who begged himself to build it and quarrelled with his heirs. That he created a generous and jolly building despite himself. Though his descendants tinkered with it, they didn't sweep away the original Jacobean decorations for anything more modish. And so we have here some of the most important, if not the most important, examples of early 17th century English decorative styles. It's hard to understand how such a frolicsome building, with its jokes, like the replication of the silhouettes of the towers in the gable ends, came to be marooned in a patched and crumbling sea of tarmac. You wonder whether the boys from the black stuff just showed up one day and offered the corporation a cut price deal. When Queen Victoria declared Aston Hall open in 1858, she hoped it would prove a place of recreation for the people of Birmingham. In fact, Aston Park turns out to be more important to the people of Birmingham than Aston Hall because there's a woeful lack of green spaces around here. And so we find people walking their dogs playing football, courting, sitting quietly under the trees, dreaming. We found a policeman exercising his horse very beautifully. This toilet over here offered so much recreation to the cottages of Birmingham that it was decided to put a padlock on it, which seems a bit mean. There's no charge for visiting Aston Hall. Even if there was, it would cover only a tiny proportion of the escalating cost of maintaining the ancient fabric. To the incessant damage done by pollution, add the equally incessant damage done by vandalism, and the struggle seems not only hopeless, but pointless. Visitor numbers are down. The attendants say sadly that the people of Birmingham would rather spend their Sunday afternoons at car boot sales than wandering round this gloomy house. These alabaster fireplaces with their crazy knobs and bobbles should be showing their translucence against firelight, but they are cold and dull. This wallpaper has been painstakingly copied from an 18th century pattern, but printed in 20th century unfading inks of too hard and chemical a green. The heaving floor of this splendid gallery 
creaks more loudly than a galleon at sea. It should be scrubbed, not polished, by the way. The corporation has used the building as a repository for bits and pieces of antique junk that it can find nowhere else to put. The house is now a country house museum, and as such, a showcase for these odds and ends. Few of the visitors who dutifully proceed from the state rooms to the attics understand the relationship of the grand public rooms to the private apartments and servants' quarters, the parts of the house that were really lived in. They scramble back to earth down these steep stairs where servants used to toil carrying coals or firewood, hot water or linen or my lady's chocolate or my lady's chamber pot. Most of us, if we'd so much as clapped eyes on Aston Hall in her heyday, would have had business here below stairs, fetching and carrying, that sort of thing. I rather fancy my job would have been to scrape down that beautiful oak table. In the far southwest of the county, reigning over a stunning landscape, stunningly landscaped, is Ragley Hall. Ragley Hall presents a monumental front of 15 bays, a basement, two upper stories, a balustrade, and a hipped roof. That is essentially the house Robert Hooke built for the Earl of Conway about 1680 to 1690. The Earls of Conway, also known as the Seymour family, own the house still. Ragley Hall was built to impress, and impress it must. Only the carriage trade entered up the outer staircase and in at the grand portico built onto the house about a hundred years after the main part was finished. They found themselves dwarfed by the Great Hall, a space which is meant to intimidate celebrating as it does in every detail of its riotous stucco work, military prowess. The ceiling of this cavern is 40 feet above us at the level of the attic ceilings. To enter this huge room is to be reduced to ant size, not necessarily in comparison to individual members of the Seema family who might or might not be present, but in comparison to the thousand-year-old dynasty, it is the dynasty that is the point. The Great Hall was dug out of the house for Francis Seymour, the first Marquess of Harford, perhaps to honour the distinguished military career of his second son, Henry. The wag who painted this pink has not quite succeeded in drawing a nylon velvet glove over the iron fist. Seamerness overwhelms the visitor who happens on the south staircase with its trompe l'oeil depiction of the extended Seema family, complete with dogs and cat, Clearly, Ragley is in better shape than poor, grimy Aston Hall. Here there is life coming and going, and people who care. And people sleep in the beds here. The price is that the family has to put itself on show, alongside the family silver. In the library, we may inspect family albums, and apparently we do. Presumably the Seamers do it because they love Ragley. But how can anyone love a place that is public? How could anyone enjoy sitting in this library, knowing that people have been trudging through it all day? Without people, a house of this size is dead. I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a ghost. It's not worth it. 
Also, uh, we, we opened the, the summer he was born, so he's never known it otherwise. He's never known the house not open. Well, except during the winter, of course. And what would be the difference if you'd handed over to the trust to run it as a tourist attraction while you skulked in a, a part of it? Well, I'd have had nothing to do, which would be frightfully boring. <laughs> oh, at least three quarters of the running courses are paid for by tourism, uh, yes, by which I include without, things without like... Without the estate to back it up, you'd have there a would be a shortfall. Oh, a very big one, yes. Uh, but, I mean, we, we farm three and a half thousand acres now. When I began, I started on 200 acres, but we've gradually taken in hand more and more. Well, the trustees did want to knock it down at some point, didn't they? My trustees were going to do it just before my 21st birthday. I, I only heard about it because the family lawyer wrote and said, I think you ought to know what is going on. And what was going on was that they were going to sell this beautiful house to a firm of demolition contractors for £5,000 which at that time was the price of a Bentley. And I thought then, and I still do, that that is worth a great deal more than a motor car. Places like Ragley do matter. I'm not sure if I matter, but uh, Ragley certainly does. Snug behind its protecting wall of Warwickshire red brick is my very favourite part of Ragley, the cottage originally built for the head gardener. A handsome house, not built to envious show, but to bring deep pleasure to the people who see it every day because they live in it. This is my second favourite bit of Ragley. All Pevsner says is that the stable block is semicircular and single-storied. He doesn't see fit to notice that it has a painted second story. That top row of windows are all blind. And it's not actually a second story, of course, but simply a wall. Nor does he seem to notice that this section over here has no building behind it, whatever. It's simply a wall made to match the rest in the interests of complete symmetry almost as if the stables were a stage set, a decor for something. This blind wall was in danger of collapsing, so the seamers were given half a million pounds or so from the Heritage Fund to build these impressive buttresses in handmade brick to support it. Where once the visiting gentry came shyly through the park to importune the housekeeper to show them round the house, 20,000 visitors a year pay their money to shuffle through. The estate has just provided a venue for the Newfoundland Dog Water Trials, and tonight there is to be a fireworks and laser concert. Ragley Hall is alive, but dancing on a tightrope. If EC subsidies should cease, or the concerts lose their popularity, all of this will be merely a memory. Curzon Street Goods Station is the original terminus to the London-Birmingham Railway, and so it forms the counterpart to Euston Station and Euston Arch. It is also the work of the same architect, and the same date, by Philip Hardwick, 1838. As the Euston Arch was wantonly destroyed, the Curzon Street Goods Station must be preserved at all costs. You could see Curzon Street Station as bred by commercial chutzpah out of Ragley. 
Its portico with four giant ionic columns, each 44 feet high, could be a cheeky quotation from Ragley with its portico and its columns. The intention was to treat clients of the railway as if buying a ticket turned us into toffs, one and all. This lofty space soaring up to its lantern is conspicuously non-functional. The cantilevered stone staircase is a throwaway piece of ingenious gigantism. And here is one of my favourite things, a rising sun window, like a smiling eye on the sky. There's an important contrast with Ragley, however. The directors of the railway didn't have enough land to realise their whole scheme, and they found that money was not enough to acquire it. The original scheme, with another wrought iron gate on the right to balance the one on the left, was never completed. Only 16 years after Curzon Street Terminus was built, another terminus was opened at New Street. Those original buildings have now disappeared under a concrete slab, to use Pevsner's expression. But Curzon Street still floats above the devastation, defying even the most vandalous of town planners. The spirit in which Curzon Street Terminus was conceived was revolutionary, industrial revolutionary. It seemed inevitable then that industrialization would bring huge benefits to ordinary people and the privileges of the gentry would be as nothing compared to the achievements of capital. Nowadays, industrial architecture seeks the greatest floor area for the least cost and is generally grimly functional but early factories were often full of fantasy and daring. When you add to the optimism and earnestness of their designers and builders, Warwickshire's centuries-old understanding of the ways of brick, you have the complex of bridges and balustrades, parapets and stairs that make up the canal architecture of Birmingham. complex of buildings and Curzon Street survived the post-war frenzy that swept away so much of inner Birmingham and provide a genuine link with heritage. It's high time, in my view, that more preservation orders were issued for buildings of this kind. But not, of course, if they're to be turned into a theme park of the Industrial Revolution. That's the only one of these buildings, by the way, that Presner actually notices. Birmingham Gun Barrel Proof House, Banbury Street. Hidden by the railway lines for most of its life, the intimate character and scale of this building are totally unexpected, and therefore all the more charming. Built in 1813 and designed by John Horton, architect and builder of Derritend. Above the central door is a splendid group of trophies designed by William Hollins. In a tranquil deer park, far from the roar of the motorways that slice up the county, stands a building of much more than local interest, St. James Great Packington. If one were to name the most important and the most impressive English church of the end of the 18th century, Great Packington, would be the first to come to mind. The designer, Joseph Bonomi, 
transform the character and associations of traditional red brick to build this monumental church. The result looks less like a church than an industrial building, a furnace or a smelter perhaps, a brickworks even. Pevsner disliked the exterior. He described it as rudely utilitarian, completely and totally unornamented, though he could hardly not have seen the corner towers. This building has the semicircular windows that we saw so many of at Curzon Street. Windows meant to give light for the work in hand. The work in hand here is worship, but worship of a peculiarly rational kind. There are no pointed arches here, only two barrel vaults symmetrically intersecting, borne up by stout columns that bring the eye and the mind firmly back to earth. I rather regret the conventional and now old-fashioned placing of the altar at the east end. It clearly should be a simple table in the middle, with the faithful gathered around it, all equal in the eyes of their God. And there shouldn't be any pews either. But you can't have everything. What St. James celebrates is order, symmetry, harmony, rational religion, with almost Masonic fervor. This would be a wonderful stateroom for Sarastro in the Magic Flute, which was written the year after the church was finished. The organ is older than the church and was reputedly regularly played by Handel, so Handel is what you get. Birmingham suburbs, Bourneville. Like some jungle growth, Birmingham stretched and spread under the thrust and urge of the Industrial Revolution. On our way to Bourneville, we passed thousands of homes of this sort, which were built during the Victorian age. Too many are still in use today. And then, four and a half miles from the city centre, we suddenly find ourselves in a setting like this. A garden village in the heart of a city. A green oasis in the wilderness of bricks and mortar we have just passed through. Bourneville is a continuation of the Enlightenment theme. In 1879, George Cadbury decided to move the family chocolate factory from the centre of Birmingham to the countryside and to build workers' accommodation in the immediate vicinity. The object was simple and noble, the creation of an environment fit for the 20th century worker and his children to live in. It would be difficult to overestimate the success or the influence of this experiment by George Cadbury. Bourneville originated at a time when the agitation for town planning and the ideas of the garden city and the garden suburb were being developed, and its example was fundamental to their subsequent growth and the standards eventually developed for municipal housing. No house was to occupy more than a quarter of its site and 10% of the total land owned by the Trust was to be reserved for parks and open spaces. W. Alexander Harvey, who was supposed to be the architect in charge, ended up designing the first 143 cottages all himself. Descendants of the original families still live here. I think it's a pleasant place to live. The surroundings here in Bourneville are beautiful. Probably within a the city they're perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, th I think that's why we stay. Supposing you wanted to plant an enormous tree here, would they come along and say you couldn't do that because you'd take shade? Possibly so. I would have to get the, uh, the say-so, the, the agreement of the Bourne Village Trust. So those people who've done sort of fairly violent things to their houses, pebble-dashed them and built porches and so forth, 
they've done that with the consent of the trust. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether there's much petrol dash on Bourneville, but... Uh, there's a bit. Uh, I uh, can't yeah, there's yeah, a bit. Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, well, yes, they, they, they would have been done, or perhaps they were done many years ago, when perhaps uh, uh, the rules weren't so um, tight as they are now. This is a very good example of Harveyism, this whole row of houses. Each house is lovingly detailed, each house is slightly different. If we move down the row, we see that all the details are harmonized and balanced until we get to number 15, which has undergone an extraordinary transformation. Somebody has coated it with render, which is meant to look a bit like pebble dash, and replaced the front door with something very grand. They've also replaced the windows in the gablets with something rather grim. Double glazing, I fancy. All of this is superficial. The original house is still underneath. It can all be restored to its original condition. But for the moment, it's a bit unfortunate. Bourneville was designed before the average worker's family expected to own one car, let alone two. When the pace of life was a good deal slower and people's expectations a good deal more modest. Now people have to make sacrifices in order to live here. George Cadbury knew a thing or two about design and he cared passionately about human dignity, matters about which modern marketing doesn't concern itself at all. Cadbury's purple is a violent colour that is calculated to scream in any environment. Blots and clots and splots of purple spread out from here like a blight on the landscape. The 16th century version of social engineering is the building of almshouses for the deserving poor. Every person of substance was expected to invest in some scheme of the kind. We are here in Lord Leicester's Hospital, Warwick, originally set up in what had been medieval guild buildings to provide accommodation for poor but deserving men. It was conceived as Thomas More conceived his utopia, on the lines of a college with a master and fellows, here called brothers. The brothers, nowadays recruited from returned servicemen, still wear their distinctive dress and attend religious services together. The buildings that were taken over from the guild have survived, protected by the terms of the foundation for more than 400 years. Because these buildings have been in continuous use since the Middle Ages, they've had to undergo periodic restoration and alteration, so that now they present a bit of a conundrum to the historian of architecture. Many a jolly hour could be spent interpreting the faces that these buildings present to the world, which is where Pevsner comes in. Lord Leicester's Hospital, Warwick. The master's house is of about 1850 externally, with overdone details, especially lots of bears with ragged staffs. This courtyard has on the east side a wooden gallery on the ground, as well as the upper floor. It is an elegantly detailed piece with four centred arches. The rail of the outer stair is Elizabethan. This small enclave of modest buildings abounds in cosy nooks and corners. High above the congested street is a garden ordained for the brothers' use, the more peaceful these days because there are few visitors. Despite the traffic that crowds the streets of Warwick, local businesses are languishing and dying for lack of trade. The tourists are all bound for Warwick Castle. 
now owned and run by Madame Tussaud, the castle hauls in 800,000 national and international visitors a year. They eat, buy souvenirs and attend entertainments within the castle walls, then back on their coaches and off again. When I was teaching at Warwick, the late Earl of Warwick, known to his friends and to me as Brookie, used to rescue me from the ugliness of the campus and bring me here for unforgettable lunches of boarding school food and amazing wine, spotted dick and chateau equivalent. Needless to say, this isn't the way the public comes into Warwick Castle. If, voila, lawn mowers everywhere, more lawn mowers than Brookie could afford. The mound of Warwick Castle goes back to the time of William the Conqueror. As it is now, it is all landscaped with walls climbing up from north and south and a keep with two turrets on top. Much of this is of circa 1600 and the early 19th century. The Clarence Tower and Bear Tower are both polygonal and low and the archway between them was made between 1788 and 1809. In Shakespeare's time, Warwick Castle was a ruin the roof open to all weathers. Sir Fulk Greville, created Baron Brook in 1621, bestowed much cost, at least £20,000, in the repairs thereof, beautifying it with the most pleasant gardens, plantations and walks, and adorning it with rich furniture. The work went on under his heirs, but the cedar room is today virtually the only complete 17th century space to survive, and even it has some rather unnecessary chandeliers of the wrong period. In the winters, Brookie used to travel all over the world, desperately trying to sell Warwick as a tourist venue on the international circuit. And on summer evenings, when he was in residence, used to have to crawl around the castle on hands and knees so as not to bob up unexpectedly in the middle of the dreaded soy lumiere. <laughs> I know this room. This was Brookie's private sitting room, his snug. We used to come in here after dinner and Brookie would sit there on that very same club fender, if I'm not mistaken. Looking extremely tatty now. You'd think that Madame Tussaud could treat herself to a new one. And I would sit on a sofa there, perhaps even that sofa, except it wasn't that colour. I think it was dark blue. And Brookie would give me a glass of noble claret and explain to me the strange fate of the 20th century aristocracy. I don't know who these two coves are, I'm sure. When Brookie threw in the towel in 1978 and sold the castle to Madame Tussauds for the knockdown price of five million pounds, he was widely reviled, quite unfairly in my view. Aristocrats have always had to be showmen, but Brookie was a shy man. The struggle to keep the Warwick inheritance together ruined his life, only to be lost after all. Now the legendary feats of the kingmakers are performed by actors in costume, with words not by Shakespeare. Shall I? No! Shall I? No! no! <sighs> I'm looking for a building I knew quite well 25 years ago. It's actually a hunting lodge belonging to the castle. 
It is built on the site of a hunting lodge where Queen Elizabeth used to dally with Essex. And when I came here, it was completely derelict. And I, I asked Brookie if I could give a party in it for my students before their exams. And the dress code was rags. But the piece de resistance was a sucking pig that we roasted on a spit in the fireplace in the entrance hall. Now, if I'm getting this right at all, the hunting lodge should be inside this wood. There it is. It's got topiary. And there's a baby, I see. A little girl on a tricycle. Oh, for heaven's sakes, look at this. Absolute bijou. Oh, look, it's the same. Hunting Lodge, in the park, across the river. Gothic of 1764 to 66. Oblong and cruciform. Embattled pediment. Most windows with arched lights. It's been so nicely done. And they painted the window frames the right way. I don't believe it. These people are geniuses, whoever they are. Oh, it's perfect. Perfect. I seem to remember that niche in a not very respectable connection. See real lead up there. You've done a wonderful job. Did you have to re-roof it? Yes. The new owner of the lodge is neither an aristocrat or a showman. His house is not a public place, but I have his permission to show you some of it. Ah, there it is, exactly as I remember it. The fireplace where we spitted the pig. Wax. Oh, wow. I begged Brookie to let me live in the lodge for a peppercorn rent so that I could restore it for him. And he said that he'd be liable for the capital gains tax on my improvements and he couldn't afford it. He had no option but to let the lodge fall down. Now it's being lived in by somebody who loves it and who has restored it with such care and such attention to detail. And the entail that ruined Brookie's life has been overturned at last. And from here, Warwick Castle looks not like the fun fair it has become, but like something grand and noble, like a dream of history. Well, three top photographers are taking digital pictures in the Midlands in the Black Country, Leicester, home of Britain's space industry, and Birmingham at 10. But stay with us now for a quick flick through one of the Samuel Johnson Prize finalists next. <laughs> 